Define here. Uh, a present and available. So, what we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to go over the book. Um, Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel. And how you, at home, can best utilize this particular book in existing campaigns or even starting from scratch here. So what we're going to do and what I have pulled up here is roll 20. Roll 20 is what I utilize for all of my, my tabletops. It's what I use for work. It's my job to utilize this to be a DM and, and things like that. Now you are fully capable of getting the PDF format or the book format and doing the same thing. Um, I just am going to pull the pages up through roll 20. Uh, so you will be able to, oops, sorry, I keep bumping this. So you'll be able to see what this looks like, at least in this virtual tabletop format. I found it to be rather easily, uh, navigatable, which is fantastic. Most of these newer roll 20 modules do a fantastic job of being really easy to go through. Now, uh, at the top of this, I will go through the same spiel again that I did for our adventure. And if you haven't seen that, we had a Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel adventure, The Fiend of Hollow Mine. Uh, that is also up here on the YouTube, as well as we just played it here on Twitch. Uh, and you can find that in the description down below as well. So, the Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, what is this? Through the mists of the ethereal plane shines the Radiant Citadel. Travelers from across the multiverse flock to this mysterious bastion to share their traditions, stories, and calls for heroes. A crossroads of wonders and adventures, the Radiant Citadel is the first step on the path to legend. Where will your journeys take you? Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel is a collection of 13 short standalone D&D adventures featuring challenges for characters levels 1 through 14. Each adventure has ties to the Radiant Citadel, a magical city with connections to lands rich with excitement and danger. Each can be run by itself or as part of an ongoing campaign. This is where I realized that it's kicked me out of my closed captions thing, unfortunately. Uh, explore this rich and varied collection of adventures in the magical lands, and what I would like to say is that it is not necessarily tied only to... Um, the uh the citadel itself you can use this in in any capacity that you you might want to and i'm going to show you the best way to, to to go about doing that because i found that the most interesting and probably the most useful portion of this particular module module collection of adventures isn't necessarily the adventures um but is going to be the lands that you go to, the 15 founding uh, nations that make up the Radiant Citadel. We'll get to that in just a moment, though. So where we're going to begin now is just at the Radiant Citadel proper here. As you can see, I can drag us on over to this particular map, and we're just going to go on over to that here. You got the giant diamond, the auroral diamond that makes up the, uh, the Citadel center here. And as I did in our particular little uh, adventure, I am going to read from this again, just because it has a great uh, description of what this place actually is. The Radiant Citadel is a testament to a lost age of extraordinary magic and mythical beasts. The city rises from a gargantuan fossil, and every road and building has been carved from it. The Citadel is a place of beauty and wonder with a vast array of vegetation and a multitude of sites and inhabitants. The Auroral Diamond is the thing at the heart of the Radiant Citadel, a massive gemstone of unfathomable, unfathomable power. Wow, my words today. Its life-giving magic runs through the entire city. City's vegetation, water, light, and unique artifices depend on the diamond itself. Now, there are various different places uh, that are marked here on your map. The Court of Whispers, they barter for knowledge, the Heralds, the Criers, the Speakers of the Ancestors, the people that rule this place. Um, basically, they are housed here at the, the Court of, of Whispers. They keep track of the major concerns of the homelands, the 15 homelands here. The House of Convalescence is like the, the hospital. The life-giving energies of the Aurora Diamond are used for incredible feats of healing magic. Uh, the Keening Gloom is beyond the light of the Radiant Citadel. It is a raging ethereal cyclone. So yes, outside of the Radiant Citadel here as it floats through ethereal space uh, is just nothingness. 
They carved a fossil. How can we study it now? I think it's being actively studied, but yes, it's been studied for quite some time. Is this a new campaign setting or just more lore stuff? So this is a potential campaign setting on its own. I find that it is very similar to any large city that you could utilize. The thing is as well, you could take the Radiant Citadel and tie it to any land that you want to. It doesn't have to be the 15, you know, founding uh, cities of the, uh, the Citadel. It could be anywhere you want it to be. Maybe the Citadel travels the, uh, the ether looking for people in trouble and sending people to assist. Right? Maybe not necessarily the just the founding locations. Those founding locations are to be utilized in a way of like getting to and from this the adventures that are within the book itself. So I would call it not necessarily a campaign setting, but a campaign location. And there are actually 15 campaign locations, not only the Citadel itself, that you could utilize. I look at the Radiant Citadel here. And I see like a smaller version of something like the city of, of Waterdeep, right? Um, a, a rather um, eclectic populace of people, many different um, things going on here. And there's always, there's going to be stuff to do on this citadel, not just like out in the world around. So you could entirely make like bits of your adventure take place in the ethereal plane, on this floating citadel in the ethereal ocean, right? And uh, I, I think it would be totally worthwhile to do that. And there's plenty of factions and things to interact with in here uh, as well. There's a lot of details in which like how this place functions. Um, things called the Concord Jewels uh, are these like plane shifting jewels that exist in the ether around the citadel. These are what tie it to the uh, the founding nations, but also could be utilized as just transport, uh, plane shifting transports to any world that you would like to. Can you mine that diamond? You actually cannot. The Auroral Diamond is indestructible. There's, there's been many experiments done and they have never been able to find a way to break the damn thing. So that's probably for the best, considering that it has incredible healing powers and magic. Uh, and it should be utilized as such instead of being broken in any way, shape, or form. Life in the Citadel. Um, the Citadel is a city of immigrants. The explorers who reclaimed the Citadel were refugees that escaped hardships that plagued their lands and chose the Citadel as, its, as their home, despite the strangeness here. The art and culture of the Citadel reflects that immigrant culture that comes in and people lean on and learn and borrow from each of the cultures as they come around. And it is displayed in the art, clothing, and music and how things blend together. And it says specifically, perhaps most vividly, the food, giving some like actual examples here that like the most popular because uh, cuisines are fusion dishes like couscous infused with habanero and saffron and uh, panela coated fried yams and kimchi tacos, things like that. Yes. Uh, there's also, again, plenty of factions in here for you to utilize. Uh, and they also even go through tariffs and taxation and how things function in this society if you would like to use it at your home table. I think it is incredibly easy for you to take a piece of this like in your existing campaign if you all you wanted to do was just use the citadel as a jumping off point for your adventures and let's say you're running in a very traditional Faerunian universe right is that you just have one of these concord jewels show up right you can just have one of these jewels show up and say that it is tied to this specific location and that it showed, you know, it started appearing rather recently or something like that. And that just is an easy jumping off point because people are going to look at this thing. The Concord Jewels are interesting in that they're like giant turquoise. They're like the size of houses. It's like a turquoise, a yellow quartz, a, a water opal, a fire opal, just like landing on the ground somewhere, opening up and people being, you know, ushered inside. It's definitely interesting enough that any of my normal groups would probably go at least take a look. That being said, you could also just stick the Citadel itself in the ground. It doesn't necessarily have to function as something that's like out in this ethereal plane. You could just be like, yep, this is a city that exists just in the world with a giant diamond in it, right? And you can teleport from these locations, these, you know, gems that are around here and plane shift across realms, things like that. 
So, yeah, I think it's it's pretty easy to involve this particular city in, in various different ways and including any other um, societies that you would like in it. Again, not necessarily just the 15 founding cultures, but in addition to those cultures, you can provide extra things as well, right? And you can make it even more of a melting pot of the type of people um, that you need to involve to get your players involved in this area. So there's plenty of stuff for, for you to like look at there. There's even legends and lore that are surrounding the Radiant Citadel. And it does give some look into how best to use the Citadel here, giving you ideas about like finding the Citadel, reaching it, connecting adventures together here, or using things like that. Now, I think it's an incredibly easy way to just have a jumping off point to go on adventures, you know, I think it's relatively easy to involve. I know some people struggle in trying to take some of these, like, out-of-the-box, non, um, you know, like, ah, here's Run. this is our Feyrunian adventure, and it is, like, the same as we've done before, and I know all of these places, and I know all of these things. I think it is incredibly useful to reach into this book and pull out one of the 15 locations if you need something new or somewhere to go that is just different and rooted in like some deep cultural ties and is just super colorful and entertaining and honestly just it it feels super well thought out and is something that i really appreciate with the adventures and the locales that you go to and this is where i'm gonna i'm gonna go into my favorite portion of the book it's not the adventures the adventures are fantastic again they are levels 1 through 14 and we took a level 4 uh adventure and i scaled it up to level 5 and it was you know fun and interesting to go through i cut out some of the uh uh the content like combat encounters due to time and things like that but it was still an interesting thing to do and i i think with all of the combat encounters it definitely would have made for six people a challenging fifth level uh there's a bit of like a in the mine it's a bit of a uh, dungeon crawl I, I think it would have actually been a rather challenging experience and um i, I think if we had more time or two sessions even that it, it would have really panned out in that way uh, that being said, my favorite portion of each of these particular uh, adventures, and now I kind of wish it was organized in a in a in a better way. They have them organized by the adventure, and for the each of the realms that you go to, each of the fifteen different locales. Um, I kind of wish they were had like put it all in the appendices at the end, but fortunately, with like the roll twenty ability, is that like you can move it wherever you'd like to. In the book, they'll be at the end of each of the adventures. And I think you might want to just bookmark those or put little tabs into them. They're called the Gazetteers. Now, for this, it's going to look like a lot of text, right? I'm not going to read all of this, but the biggest portion is they got maps. They got maps. They got great maps. Maps of all of these locales that you can go to here, right? So here, I'm going to pull it up on the big page um, as we go over to it, right? Boom, look at this awesome map, this location that you're going to go to. And we only go to, in this adventure, like in the first one here, the Night Market. This is the only locale that you actually go to in this particular adventure. And it leaves so much more open for you to go and explore and to just take part in. And it gives ideas for that as well. In each of these, uh, like, in each of the adventures here, if you go to the Gazetteer, it's going to tell you all about each of the different areas here. Life, how it functions here, how the rulers work here, how religion works here, how names function in each of the locales. And then it gives you ideas on like how to actually put different adventures in the location if you need ideas. And these are things that people could just learn by like coming across this location. I love, honestly, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to do, uh, but the Roll20 group actually did the night market adventure uh so i could not choose it and uh it is super awesome and colorful and it is the the cover of the um the cover of the book has the night market on it there and it's got that little bat creature that's eating all the food 
super cool. But like, look at the way that the mountains are shaped around this next to this huge river. This is a locale that could be in any world that you wanted to put it in. And the amount of detail put into it means you do not have to design a city. You don't have to design a city. You don't have to design a, 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 a country for your, your people to adventure in. It's all right here already. And you can just take this, pick it up, and put it somewhere where you want it to be. And it'll just be full of this already ready-made culture for you to explore. So I, I think a lot of the larger things here, as we kind of like go through each of the gazetteers as you look at them, they're at the end, again, of each of the, the different adventures, um, giving lots of really good detail on that front. And I'll, I'll go ahead and pull up the map for the, the night market as well. Yeah, as like the night market itself too, right? And it's just so... The maps are nice. Now, they're not like the full color maps that um, some of the like adventure modules you get are. Uh, and I, I kind of wish they were. But I still think they're, they're perfectly usable. Um, and they're going to get the job done for your adventure. And if you wanted to make something similar to these... Uh, in your own adventure and maybe, you know, with your own assets and stuff like that. I think this is a really easy way and a, a way for you to copy this. So that's that's the most useful portion, I think, of the book is those gazetteers. It's, it's the way that you can put these into any campaign in any location at all. Uh, it's just spilled water all over me. Uh, I see it as very similar to like how like the Ravenloft um, planes work. And those are kind of specific in that like, oh, you go to this plane and it acts like this. Uh, but I feel like you could still take each of those things and put it anywhere you would like to. I needed to cool off anyways. I know I've been running hot here. We've been we've been going for about six hours, so. Uh, we'll do a little Q&A at the end if you guys would like to as well. So that being said, the second portion of this that I find very awesome. The art is incredible. This is the cover that I was talking about with the, the little bat creature flying and stuff like that. The art is absolutely incredible. This is the night market. Look how freaking cool this is. And you could put the night market anywhere, right? Like you could just take this piece of this adventure and put this enormous colorful market into one of your cities at home and have this bit of adventure just built right in and each of the uh the adventures that are here are so well written it's so easy to just take and tweak some numbers here and there for levels and things like that and yeah i i think it's absolutely like god look at the art Demonic, so the second adventure is demonic possession and stuff like that. Look at the, like, the red eyes. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And I'll show uh, some of the ones from here. The Fiend of Hollow Mine. I didn't even show this piece of art because I felt like it was going to give too much away. Uh, the ghouls. The ghouls dragging the body into the mine. Out the ruins of the, uh, the hollow village. And all the cacti and things like that. So good. So I think there's always, like, there's a lot to be said for for this here. And um, our favorite lady, Paloma, from the adventure. And the book is full of, of art like this. And I feel like it, it could be uh, rather... If you buy the book and don't have access to show your players things like this, I think you should find a way to. Because I think it, it brings a whole... Look at all the color and life that this just has that can give you that feeling of what they're interacting with, right? And I think it helps add to the descriptions. I loved the skeleton people from that adventure too. It was so cool. It was so cool. What was the... Uh, there was another one. Oh, yeah. The tiger spirit on this one. And then there's... uh. The shrine, the dragon shrine. So neat. And there was one more that I thought was super, super cool. And I think it was Trail of Destruction. The observatory collapsing. Hmm. 
There's a lot of really good stuff in this book. Now, I think the largest barrier to entry here for this book is going to be um, fear, maybe? Apprehension about things that are different. Cultures that you don't know. Every bit of this book was written by a person with like intimate knowledge of the culture that it is emulating. And there's a whole lot of respect that we have to show to like the legends and the lore and the food and the people and the color and the music that comes out of a book like this. This is Wizards of the Coast first all uh, POC written book. Uh, and I think it is a huge step forward for them that they should have taken a long time ago. Now, me being sponsored by Wizards of the Coast with this, that is about all I can say on that front. And that is fine. I think that this is a great step forward and a good way to do it. You have the Radiant Citadel, which floats on the outside of, of canon space. They created new spaces in the planar realms. Uh, so you avoid the... Uh, you know, neckbeard, old old head dudes that can't stand anything new in their games. Uh, and you just say, don't use it. It doesn't exist for you. That's great. But I think there's going to be a lot of people like myself. I mean, I'm a cishet white dude, right? And there's a lot of like care that needs to be taken and put into um, what we look at and how we portray different cultures and how we act with different cultures and things like that. There is never a need for you to try and emulate the accent of the culture that these things are based on. I didn't. I didn't do that today. I used some old standby accents that I've used for six years now to, you know, show an older woman, you know, of distinction or a, you know, kind of grimy politician, things of that nature, right? There's never a need for you to try and emulate the culture that these things are coming from through your speech. And it's totally okay for you to emulate these other cultures and like different colors and creeds and things of that nature, as long as you are respectful about it. Um, when describing people's skin tones and things like that, don't just go like black, brown, whatever, but like add different things to it. Um, try to keep it in, you know, color tonalities and things like that, like reddish hues or um, like brown, like a cinnamon brown or something like that instead of like just keeping it very stark in those regards and i think it is great practice as dms to to have that kind of distinction right to take the time to practice in describing other cultures other than your own and i looked up a lot of stuff for this i needed to utilize their uh for fortunately for this uh this guy's one of my favorite. I really wanted to run this adventure because of him. I'll come back to him in a second. Um, each of these background sections here have pronunciation guides, which I used absolutely the entire time. I Googled stuff. I, I looked stuff up to like figure out how do I actually say all of these things because I have a dumb white man mouth and I cannot formulate a lot of these words. And so I practice. And I think it's important as like DMs for to like to show these different cultures and to show them respect and to bring them to your players in a way that they can find interesting and entertaining and also connect with it in a way that allows them to other understand or at least feel some connection to different people from around the world. I think it's, I think it's great to do it, to take the time to do it. And fortunately with these adventures, you can take some of that time to learn some of these pronunciations uh, because the adventures are so well written, you don't really have to prepare them. They're good to go. Especially if you're following any of like the level, uh, suggested levels. And even if you want to like bump them up in difficulty a little bit and bump up your level some, it, they're good to go. They're incredibly well written. So I, I think it is very valuable to take the time to like look at each of the backgrounds and, and learn some of the, the pronunciations of the realms that you are looking at here. This is my favorite dude. I love him so much. This dragonborn with his cup of tea and uh, he just looks so 
nonchalantly elegant. I love him so much. I, I want that like, I want his clothes. <laughs> He's fantastic. So, that's kind of the 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 long and, and short of it here. Without going into each of the different um, adventures as a whole here, and I think we don't necessarily need to do that. Um, looks like a Korean style handbook. Uh, there is a lot of that there, and and a lot of the fortunate things with like reading into this here is that when they give the description of these people and they describe the clothing sometimes for them, they, um, also here's the like, you know, pronunciations here of the names and how to pronunciate, pronunciate, pronounce each of the syllables and things like that. It's super useful. Uh, when they describe clothing and stuff, they use the traditional like language of, like Serape was one that I used quite a lot. Um, tonight to describe this kind of like, you know, cloak-like cloth poncho-esque thing that uh, many of the NPCs wore in um, in the adventure tonight. So that was one of those things that like, it's actually in, you know, it's written in and it's great. And, and again, some of the stuff I had to look up and be like, I don't know that word. Let me look it up. Like different types of like cactus foods and drinks and things like that. Things based on like the agave plant and stuff. It was... It's kind of like a nice, it's a nice little like learning thing, but it's also just incredibly cool. Anyways, I love, I loved the dragons in this one. This was the other one. Sins of Our Elders was the other one that I was going to do if we did not do mines, just because I loved the way that the dragons looked. It's so funny seeing the English pronunciations when you're not a native English speaker and know the original language. That's great. That's awesome. You know, and that's super cool. I had to, I had to practice, and I still have to practice. Um, it's hard for me to to get some of those pronunciations, and I, I try really hard, but it it definitely takes practice. Can't roll your R's. I actually, I can roll. I learned how to roll my R's. I'm actually, I'm a quarter Uruguayan, but I know no Spanish, so there is that. The old lady with the pink with the crazy drip. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really look at this guy. Look how cool he is. This is this is what the monster from uh, Gold for Fools. And there's a bunch of new monsters in here too. A bunch of new enemies. Great NPCs to pull from. Um, I'm rather I'm rather impressed with this. To me, it is at least. Um, oh goodness gracious! What is the? Uh, it's as least as good as the the Candlekeep Chronicles one. Uh, if not better, due to the fact that, like, the, just the amount of information of the, of the areas you're going to is just incredible. It looks so cool. So, any, any questions about the, the game itself, uh, or questions for me as a DM running this particular game, uh... Look at this guy. Oh, it's so cool. Can I wild shape into this guy? I think he's counted as a monstrosity rather than a beast, but you could absolutely check. Uh, it's called a, an arm vax. They are monstrosities, yeah. But you could talk to your, your DM. They're challenge level four. He isn't a monstrosity. He's adorable. He's very cute. Are you aware of any maps that aren't included in the book? Always looking for ones to use in D&D &D Beyond. What do you mean, Katapano? Any other maps that aren't included in the book? Like maps of each of these areas, but not in the book? Or are you talking about like adventure maps? Like our, our mine? The mine that we went down, which was a great one. See, there were some, uh, there was encounters in the uh, the corpse pile that we didn't use, and the uh, the dinosaurs were supposed to come to life at the bottom there. Adventure maps, yes. 
Uh, I mean, I don't know what you mean about like not in the book. There are so many in the book. Look at this. This is called the, the Gate of Illumination. Look at these salamanders. Oh yeah. Big salamander boys. And then this guy. This is also one of my favorites here. Stop hitting the control button on this. Boom. Look at him. Yeah. He's a big boy. Look at all him teeth. Look at all him lava teeth. Maybe I'm not looking in the right spots. You mean the book? So the, the adventure maps are in each of the adventures. Okay? So each of the adventures will have their own, like, um, area maps. And then they'll likely have some, you know, encounter maps included as well. Uh, but each of the adventures has has their own there. Uh, there are some that, like, could have used a, a map that I didn't have. But it's okay. We kind of moved past it. Uh, so there might be some that you need to make. But that's okay. Got it, got it. That's helpful. Absolutely, yeah. So all of the area maps, and this is, this is my kind of like my biggest, not necessarily gripe, but I wish it had kind of been organized with both, um, is that the adventures hold all of the area maps. So it is something that you have to like go through each adventure to find the things that you want. But I also suggest go to each of the gazetteers. Um... And that will get you, if you're looking specifically like, ah, I want a culture that does this. I want a culture that has this thing or exists on the edge of a river or by an ocean or something like that. The gazetteers are absolutely the place to start. And then you can build your adventure out of that or follow the adventure as it is written. But yeah, so all of the stuff is kind of broken up into the adventures with the Radiant Citadel overview being the beginning portion of the book. And again, the Radiant Citadel overview is a great hub for your adventures, but it's not necessarily one that you have to use. One thing I, uh, I don't know if I got right, all of the locations are floating in space and have some kind of teleportation to move around them. Is that right? Yes and no. So the way that they have the book set up is that moving between these locations, you go to the Radiant Citadel, and the Radiant Citadel has these enormous gems, these transportation gems that connect it to the home uh, location. Each of these locations is part of the founding nations of the Radiant Citadel. The Radiant Citadel floats in empty ether space, right? So you can use them as separate planes, right? Like separate, separate planar interactions, if you'd like to, very much like Ravenloft, right? Like you go to a different plane of Ravenloft or any of the, the planes of, of hell or something like that. Or you can utilize each of these locations as actual locations on a continent, should you so choose, and just put them on your map somewhere, right? And the Citadel can still be something either as a physical city that exists in your world or as, again, this flying ether space um, city, you know? I think there's plenty of options to do it in both ways. And you can do it as written, which is that, like, ether space planar travel type thing. Or, and how I will likely utilize these locations, is that these locations are just going to exist in a campaign that I'm probably already running. They're just going to come up on it. They're going to exist in this, one of the ones that I want to run, and I'm going to put that realm, that piece of the continent, that city in front of them. And they're going to go interact with that thing, right? And then I can utilize all of this information from this book uh, in that fashion to, to make it interesting and cool. How and where can we find this book? Well, let me pull up uh, the link here. You can find it on the Wizards websites, or you can follow this link right here, or you can get it at any uh, of your local game stores, ordered online, or on Roll20 or D&D Beyond, any of these locations. It is available right now. It is fully available right now. Um, yeah. Thanks for hanging out. Those of you that watched the show earlier, thank you for being here for that. If you haven't seen it, it will be up on YouTube tomorrow. That's youtube.com slash runawayrobot. Big thank you again to 
Wizards of the Coast for sponsoring not only this DM talk here, but the show previous as well. I hope you all have an excellent evening. Thank you for joining me on this little look into the Radiant Citadel. And I hope your trip into the ether goes well. Bye, everyone.